Good evening, everybody. How many heard about the rapid, very uh, frightening hailstorm they had in Argentina? Okay, not many of you. All right, so we want to show you a short video. And remember, this is some of the hail, I think they said was baseball or, or larger sized. Uh, but remember, the Lord told us that in the last days when he brings his judgment, there'll be hailstones the weight of a talent. That's somewhere between 75 and 120 pounds, depending on whose weight system you're using, which I don't think if it lands on your head, you're going to care whether that was 75 pounds or 120 pounds. It'll do the same kind of damage. But watch how fast hail can change things in this video. very rapidly, very interesting, caught people just, I don't know, you can see they're stuck in their cars trying to get somewhere, and uh, came in so quickly that they had to just stop and get rescued. A couple news articles tonight, but that's if we get far enough into Isaiah. So we are in Isaiah tonight, chapter 15, Isaiah 15, as we continue. Father, we come before you, we thank you for your word. What a difficult job it must be to be a prophet, as Isaiah can see the judgment that's coming to the different nations, the Moabites and others, and he's affected just knowing it's coming. How we pray, Lord, that you would help us to see you do know the end from the beginning. You do have your own timetable. You have not forgotten about the things going on in this world that need to be made right. And Lord, you know, each one you say, the very hairs of our head are numbered this evening before you. You know our hopes, our desires, our struggles, Lord, our anxieties. You know all these things. You know our failures, and yet you love us. And so, Lord, as we study through these judgments, these pronunciations by Isaiah against these nations, Lord, may we also see in these things that you are faithful. And thank you, Lord, where you forgive they are forgiven. And so, Lord, thank you so much for sending your son, who is the bearer of the new, the better covenant, that is in his own blood, where he was shed once sins, blood shed once for sins, and by faith righteousness comes to all who believe. Thank you for so great a salvation. Be with us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name, in your word. Amen. Chapter 15, now Moab, we've, we've listened about Assyria and Babylon and, and Syria and there is Syria. Ah, Syria, Babylon, and Israel, the northern ten tribes. But now Moab comes into the focus of Isaiah the prophet. We didn't get far enough last week as we only finished chapter 14. Chapter 15, the burden of Moab. Where is the nation of Moab from? It's a gold star question. How many have heard of Lot? Lot. Lot, Abraham's nephew. And he fled from Sodom and Gomorrah as it was destroyed. His wife turned, looked back. She turned into a pillar of salt. He fled with his two daughters. They end up in the mountains. Uh, I won't bother with the account, but Lot's daughters and himself, they produce Ammon and Moab. And so that's where they're from. You can go back and review in Genesis around 19, moving forward, if you want to know that history. But these are ultimately Lot's descendants, which are, in a sense, kinsmen to the sons and daughters of Abraham. The burden of Moab... And if you, if you take your Bible from it and you just take the spine, the middle of your Bible, think of this as the Jordan Rift Valley, okay? So when you break out your Bible map and you see the Dead Sea and then the Sea of Galilee and then the Mount Hermon up to the north, you know, as you're looking, uh, that would be the Jordan Rift Valley. And, and as you look there, there's, there's several thousand feet up to Jerusalem from this valley. The Dead Sea is about 1,200, 1,300 feet below sea level. Now, it's interesting because in Israel, there will be private pilots who will go over rent planes and they'll fly through that Jordan Rift Valley above the Dead Sea, and the altimeter will be negative 600 feet. And they'll take a photo of that, because technically they're flying 600 feet below sea level. Right? So, never mind. It's like flying underwater. Anyway, so they take photos, and they think they're all cool. But you'll see people flying through that Rift Valley so they can fly below sea level. But here, this, this big rift, you have on this side, which would be, I guess, from, from my perspective, 
If I'm looking from the Dead Sea north through Israel, then on this side, this is the western side where Israel is, okay, or at least is today, although they were on both sides when they first came out of Egypt. And on the eastern side is what is today Jordan and to the north Syria. And then if you go all the way down to a lot, then you eventually hit Egypt. So you're talking about this mountain ridge that's looking towards Jericho, that's looking towards Jerusalem to the west. And so this is the region we're talking about, Moab and Ammon and these two areas. And if you're at the Dead Sea, that ridge there, that mountain ridge area above the Dead Sea on the eastern side, which as you look at your Bible map would be the right side, that is these mountains that we're going to be talking about this evening. Okay, so if you get a Bible map and you want to try and follow this and the rivers and all, you want to go to the Dead Sea, go to the right of the Dead Sea, and you'll find that region that's being talked about, and uh, we'll talk about it as we work our way through. Name a famous Moabite you know. Ruth, good. Ruth came from Moab. So once again, if here's the Dead Sea and you look to the left in your Bible map, you'll go up the ridge and find Jerusalem. If you're looking at your Bible map, you're like, aha, got it, up the hill there. Go south of that, you'll find Bethlehem within about five miles. If you remember, Ruth would be, well, Naomi would leave with her husband and they would go over to the area of Moab because of a famine. So they would go down through the valley, cross the Jordan Rift Valley, go up in the area of Moab, and there Mahan and Chilion, her sons, would find wives. You know what happens. The husband dies, the sons die, and so Ruth, Naomi decides to return and Ruth came with her. Ruth was a Moabitess from the area of Moab. So now you've got some of that layout in your mind. If you are in Jerusalem on the ridge there looking toward Bethlehem, if you just simply turn to your left as you look down into Bethlehem, you can see in the distance on a clear day very easily, and even on a foggy or a cloudy day, you can see the whole mountain ridge of Moab. So it is a distance you could walk. It would take some time, but it's very easy for you to see. So as you go there, it's amazing. You read your Bible, you stand in these locations, and you go, oh, there are the Moabite mountains. That's where Ruth would come with Naomi, and they would come all through here. And, you know, that can be done. That's reasonable. It's amazing when you go, you can begin to see how this all pulls together. But for tonight, you get a Bible spine with a couple of pages and me trying to point things out. And you're going, I don't know where he is, but at least we tried. The burden of Moab. Because in the night, R of Moab is laid waste. They too are going to be judged. Now, just for a point of reference, chapter 14, verse 28. In the year that King Ahaz died. Okay, so we had Uzziah the king, and then he was struck with leprosy in the beginning of this book, if you remember, trying to offer up incense there at the altar of incense within the temple. Uh, or, yeah, within the temple, and the Lord struck him with leprosy. He ran out. The priest threw him out. That was it. He was defiled from being king. So his son Jotham co-reigned with him until Uzziah eventually died. Jotham took over. When he died, his son Ahaz took over. That's where we are here in chapter 14, verse 28. When Ahaz died, it's about 715 B.C., and so the prophecies we get now in chapter 15, chapter 16, the timeline is about three or four years, and then they're fulfilled. So when Ahaz died, King Hezekiah would take over. Okay, Hezekiah, about his 20s, as he would begin to reign, we'll move into that. We'll learn a lot about King Hezekiah from Isaiah the prophet. But so that's your timeline. Ahaz has died, Hezekiah coming to the throne, again, about 15 uh, 715 B.C., getting down to about 711 B.C. when these things are fulfilled. And so this chapter 15, verse 1, the burden of Moab, because in the night, R of Moab is laid waste. Within about three to four years, this is done. So here's Isaiah the prophet watching as the, the kingdom is changing over in Israel. Or sorry, more specifically, Judah, the southern kingdom. Israel is the northern kingdom. I'm thinking of it in modern terms. Speaking to the southern kingdom, he's telling him, listen, here's what's going to happen. Ahaz, as he's dying, Moab has a short period of time, and then they're going to be judged. And they will be judged by, again, the Assyrians coming through. And we've talked about that in the past. We'll see some more as we work through this evening. So the burden of Moab, which will happen within three, four short years, around 711 B.C. The burden of Moab, because in the night, R of Moab is laid waste. They will be attacked. It will not go well. They're going to be judged. And is brought to silence... Because in the night, Kir of Moab is laid waste. They too also being taken out and brought to silence. And remember, we saw it in chapter 1. We see it elsewhere. The vision Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos, saw. So he's seeing this, this history in, in advance, prophecy. He's seeing these towns be suddenly invaded and overwhelmed and laid waste and the collateral damage from that. And, and you'll see Isaiah's heart at times as he goes through here. He's overwhelmed with what he knows is coming. 
Personally, I think it must be a very difficult thing to be a prophet. To really know from God what's coming. And yes, we have prophecies, but to know these things and to have seen these things, how difficult it must have been. Jeremiah often nicknamed the weeping prophet because he was so burdened knowing the judgment that was coming. He was trying to speak to his own fellow Jews there in the southern kingdom of Judah, and they mocked him and they wouldn't listen to him and they threw him in the pit there in the cistern and the prison and, and beat him and put him in all the things that happened to him. And all he was trying to do is tell his fellow countrymen, there's a judgment of God coming, you need to get right. You're thinking, it sounds like what I do at work. What an interesting time to be in as we see things speeding up prophetically. To try and tell our family members and our friends and coworkers, you know, this world's in trouble. And they, they roll their eyes and, oh, here comes, a, you know, here comes a Christian with all his thoughts. And, okay, okay, wait, wait, tell me again, Armageddon, right? The end of the world, right, right? But then something blows up somewhere around the world. And guess who they come running to find on Monday morning? You. Hey, what does this mean biblically? Oh, I thought you didn't care. Well, I do about this one. Oh, I see. So Isaiah is seeing these things. It's laid waste. It's brought to silence. Verse 2, he's gone up to Bajith, which is the idea of the house. Most argue the temple, these high places in verse 2. Bajith and Dibon, the high places to weep, the high places of their God. The Moabites worship Chemosh. Chemosh, again, human sacrifice to make their sons and daughters pass through the fire, child sacrifice. This is some of the wickedness of the Canaanites that Israel came in to judge. He's gone up to Bajith and to Dibon, the high places to weep. Moab shall howl over Nebo. What famous prophet died in the region of Nebo? Starts with a ho, ends with a sus. Anybody guess? Moses. Moses died there in the, in the mountain range of Nebo. And Aaron passing away also. Joshua taking over. Back to the Bible map idea. If we put you in, say, Chester, Pennsylvania, not Chester Springs, Chester, we got you up, say, a couple thousand feet above sea level. What Moses sees from Mount Nebo would be the same to you, basically, almost, looking over the state of New Jersey, being able to see things, for example, up at the Verrazano Narrows Bridge while standing there in Chester, Pennsylvania. That would be a bit of a stretch, don't you think? You know, the, the road to the Beltway there to get to JFK, if you've ever made that trek, you know, you get up, exit 13 for you New Jersey people, 13, 14, you know, and then you bail out there, going up to the Garden State Parkway. But he sees from Mount Nebo what is essentially the territorial range about the size of New Jersey. So he sees, and here's another thing. Let me, let me help you out with, tonight if you're thinking, where is God? I'm dealing with this, I'm dealing with that. Where is he? I'm getting upset, I'm tired of waiting, and you think like he, he, it's like he doesn't know. He knows everything. Well, then where is he? Well, he's got his timing. Why isn't he here now? It's not time yet. I found he's never early. I found he's never late. But I found he's definitely on time, and his time is not my time. You know, 11.59 and 59 seconds is still on time. But here's Moses sitting in Mount Nebo on this ridge, looking down into the Jordan River Valley, almost 3,000 feet down. And then he's looking up to the north and looking to the south. And he sees from Judah to Simeon to Benjamin to Ephraim, Manasseh, etc., Naphtali, Issachar, all the, all the area, Gad, Reuben, you know, half-tribe Manasseh. He sees all the territory. Wait a minute, Pastor. How is he seeing the land divided by the tribal portions when they have not yet crossed the Jordan River, where Joshua then would take the lot, some argue two urns, one with the territorial piece, the other with the tribe name, and they pulled lots out of two urns, at least they speculate. So he would pick out portion A, name Simeon, Simeon, you get this plot of ground. How could Moses possibly be seeing, by the direct work of God, territorial boundaries that have yet to have been drawn by random chance generator for you IT people, by lot in the future? Let me explain. How could he know what a lot would come back with for an answer when it hasn't even been done yet? That's like saying, how could he know the role of, of 12 dice and 12 portions, exactly the number sequence, before it ever happened? But that's what he's doing. He shows them from the area of Judah all the way up to the northern territory of Dan. Moses is able to see on Mount Nebo this territorial range by tribal divisions before they've ever crossed over, conquered it, surveyed it, 
and then divided it. And he's already showing to Moses what it will look like when it happens by chance. Now let me ask you that question again. Has he forgotten about you? He knows the end from the beginning. The thing that blows me away is he has set his affection on us. If you've come to Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've, you've, your eyes have been opened, you realize you are a sinner, you need a Savior, you're going to face a holy God one day, every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess, so since he's opened your eyes, better come now and confess now, because now it's to salvation. If he's brought you into his family, he knows what's coming. He knows what he's got prepared for you. And he's a good father. That's something that the, the more kids I've had, the more that has struck my heart. And at times when one of my kids are going through something or we're sitting and they're talking or praying, I'll say, listen, I don't know how to explain this to you. I would do anything for you. And I'm a father who's evil. I'm fallen. You have a good father. He knows what he's doing, even if you can't see it. That's where we learn to trust him. That's what we call faith. I don't know what he's doing, but I know who he is. And the way you know who he is, is you read what he's told us about himself. You see, the more you spend time in the word of God, the more you understand the heart of God. And even if you don't know the specific answer for your issue, you know the heart of God who's helping you walk through that issue. And so the word of God does give us light. It gives us light for what we need to do. And prayer gives us power from God to do it. It's so simple. But yet it's amazing how many things will compete for our time to sit down and read simply the word of God for ourselves. It's amazing how, well, you know, you'll have a quiet time, you get in a groove. I, I, I get this too. You're in a groove and you're spending real time and then this kind of happens or that changes in your schedule or this blows up or whatever. And next thing you know, you find you're, you're not really, you're like, uh, okay, I got a verse and I'm out. And, and you find this without even realizing it. Your, your sense of peace, your sense of God's presence, your sense of he's got this is fading. And you're thinking, where are you, God? And he's saying, I have not moved. So who moved? Usually we do. Psalm 1, blessed is the man who meditates, right? Doesn't stand the seat of scoffers, sit in the place of scorners, etc., walk in the counsel of the wicked. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and he meditates upon the law, the word of God, day and night. And there it says in Psalm 1, and whatsoever he puts his hand to will prosper. There are times, I'll sit there and I'll, I'll say, you know, Lord, I don't feel like I'm prospering right now. And that's when I realize, you know what, I need to just sit with him again. I'm not saying health, wealth, prosperity, name it, blame it, blab it, grab it. Not doing that. But you know when things, you sense like, I, I sense him. And you know those times where you feel like, I just feel like I'm on my own. And once again, he, he doesn't move. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews tells us. And so often the problem is I've forsaken coming back to that well that he told the woman at the well of living water where I can drink anytime I want deeply. And he'll give me living water flowing from within my, my soul, the midst of my belly. So here's Moses sitting on Mount Nebo, seeing the entire land before it's ever been divided, before they've ever crossed over, because God knows the end from the beginning, which means the plans that God has for your life, even if you don't necessarily like them or want to sign up for them or endorse them right now, they are good. The question is just stay tuned. So often people will say to me, well, this is happening. And I'll say to them, well, in the story of your life, have you turned the page and it says the end? And they're like, why no? I said, well, then don't panic. There's plenty of chapters left. You've got some time. So he's gone up to Badgeth, to Dibbon, the high places to weep. Moab shall howl over Nebo, over Mediba, and all their heads shall be baldness. Now, why would they make their heads bald? Why would they cut off their beard? What would be happening? Extreme grief and mourning, okay, or even duress. In Israel, your beard's everything. I know it's a little different here, but you, to have your beard ripped out is a direct offense. What did they do to Jesus? Ripped out his beard. What did they do in his face? Spinning it. He's born our sorrows, our griefs. He was spit and inflicted for our iniquities, these things Isaiah told us. So they will be baldness. Every beard will be cut off. In their streets, they shall gird themselves with sackcloth. Again, all part of the process of mourning. On the tops of their houses and in their streets, everyone shall howl, weeping abundantly. Isaiah seeing these things. Now, here's another problem, verse 3. It's after their behavior has finally come home to roost. And it blows up in their faces, so to speak. 
It's after it all goes down the tubes that they finally put on the sackcloth and they finally pull the beard and shave the head and weep and mourn. It's when, when the consequences have come, suddenly now they're repentant. Why is it we wait until everything's a mess before we finally surrender? Why is it it takes it? And, and worse, you know, for us as believers, why is it we, we you know, try to game the system and walk in things we shouldn't and we keep pretending that, you know, we've got a special exemption and then when it blows up now, we're serious about seeking God. You know, we would have saved ourselves so much pain if we just cut out that little sidetrack and just kept going. So often, it, why is it it takes that to finally bring us to a place of real brokenness before him? But that's what came to Moab with these judgments. Heshbon shall, uh, shall cry, and Alila, and their voice shall be heard even unto Jahaz. Therefore, Heshbon, by the way, you can find it, Dead Sea. Look for the Heshbon River. Go up the ridge to the east, and on the top you'll find Heshbon, at the top of the Heshbon River. Heshbon and Alila, and their voice shall be heard even unto Jahaz. Therefore, the armed soldiers of Moab shall cry out, though overrun. His life shall be grievous unto him. Here goes Isaiah with what he's seeing. My heart shall cry out from Moab. This isn't even his own people, Israel. Moab. Isaiah's weeping about this. My heart shall cry out from Moab. His fugitives shall flee unto Zoar. Hey. Remember when Lot was dragged out of the city by the angels? and his two daughters and his wife. And they said to him, flee to the mountains. And he said, oh no, don't want to do that. I'm afraid of the mountains. Can I go to this little town? It's just a little one. Even that, can I go to it? And the town's name was Zoar. You've seen that name before. And the angels gave him permission. So what does Lot do? He goes into Zoar, watches the fire and brimstone from God come down on Sodom and Gomorrah, gets afraid of that. So he goes up to the mountains. Just pointing out Lot for you this evening. Shall flee unto Zoar, a heifer of three years old, for by the morning, or the mounting up, sorry, of Luhith, with weeping shall they go up, so they're fleeing, for in the way of Horonaim shall they raise up a cry of destruction, again, fleeing as they can. For the waters of Nimrim shall be desolate, for the hay is withered away, the grass faileth, there is no green thing, famine has come with this attack. Therefore the abundance they have gotten. And that which they have laid up shall they carry away to the brook of the willows. For the cry has gone round about the borders of Moab, and the howling thereof unto Iglaim, and the howling thereof unto Berliam. They're again fleeing. For the waters of Dibbon shall be full of blood. So as they flee, they're still being pursued. And I will bring more upon Dibbon. Lions upon him that escapeth of Moab. And there were lions and bears and other things there before the Ottoman Turks and others came through and basically deforested the whole place. And upon the remnant of the land. Send ye the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah, that is Petra, the rock city in Jordan, to the wilderness under the mount of the daughter of Zion. For it shall be that as a wandering bird cast out of the nest, shall sell the daughters of Moab, or so the daughters of Moab shall be at the fords of Arnon. Let me explain. They're fleeing as refugees. How many got that picture? They're fleeing. Here once again, even back in the time of 711 BC, you've got refugees displaced by war. And they're fleeing, going, going west, sorry, through the Jordan Rift Valley, heading in towards Israel. And as they're heading in towards Israel, what do they want? They want asylum. And so what they're doing is send the lamb to the ruler of the land. In other words, ask the governor of the ruler of the land, can we come into your territory? We are refugees. Can we have asylum? That's what's going on here. It shall be like a wandering bird cast out of its nest. Their home has been lost. They're now seeking to find another home. And so they're coming west into Israel, once again looking for refuge and asylum. Like a wandering bird cast out of its nest. So the daughters of Moab shall be at the fords of Arnon. You can find the Arnon River again on that eastern side as you look at your map. It's some things you can look at for this evening. Take counsel. Execute judgment. Make thy shadows the night and the midst of the noonday. Hide the outcasts. Again, they're fleeing. Beray or betray not or uncover not him that wandereth. The idea is they're fleeing. Let mine outcasts dwell with thee. So they're coming to Judah, the southern kingdom. Moab, be thou a covert or a secret. Uh, sorry, let mine outcast dwell with thee, Moab. Be thou a covert or a secret to them. 
for the face of the, or from the face of the spoiler. For the extortioner is at an end, and the spoiler ceaseth. The oppressors are consumed out of the land. And in mercy shall the throne be established. So you have people coming to you looking for asylum. Show them mercy, your throne will be established. That's what's being told by Isaiah to the rulers surrounding Moab as they fall to Ammon. In mercy shall the throne be established, and he shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking judgment and hastening righteousness. So Isaiah is telling the people before it happens, Moab's going down, they're going to need a place to flee, let them come. We have heard of the pride of Moab. He is very proud, and of course judgment comes to them. Even his haughtiness, or of his haughtiness, and his pride, and his wrath. But his lies shall not be, show, shall not be so, they're going to be judged. Therefore shall Moab howl for Moab. Everyone shall howl for the foundations of Kirher Shith. Shall ye mourn, surely they are stricken. For the fields of Heshbon languish, again, part of their strongholds. And the vine of Sibma, fragrance. For the lords of the heathen have broken down the principal plants thereof. They are come even unto Jazer. They wandered through the wilderness. And trust me, as you go through the area of Judah, it's wilderness. Her branches are stretched out. They are gone over the sea. Therefore, Isaiah speaking, I will bewail with weeping, or bewail with the weeping of Jazer, the vine of Sibma. I will water thee with my tears, O Heshbon and Elilah. For the shouting of thy summer fruits, and for thy harvest is fallen, and gladness is taken away, and joy out of the plentiful field. You get the sense bad stuff's coming to Moab? I'm, anybody? Am I the only one seeing this? Gladness is taken away, joy out of the plentiful field. And in the vineyards there should be no singing. You know, some of the things we learned... When children feel safe, they sing, they play, they're at ease. But when they're in war zones, you find a lot of these things disappear. Interesting too, in the medical world, when a child goes through a major surgery or other things, we learned this when we spent time at CHOP, one of the ways they get Children's Hospital Philadelphia, for those who are not in Philadelphia, uh, one of the ways they can evaluate how a child's doing is when a child returns to playing, they can tell he's starting to feel or she's starting to feel better. It's interesting here in this case as they're fleeing and they're being oppressed and their land is being overtaken, singing is disappearing. In a sense, all the things, gladness is taken away, joy, all these things. This, it's oppressive. What sadness that is. Gladness is taken away, verse 10. Joy out of the plentiful field. And in the vineyards there shall be no singing. Neither shall there be shouting. The treaders shall tread out no wine in their presses. I have made their vintage shouting to cease, these things have all gone down. Wherefore, Isaiah again speaking, wherefore my bowels shall sound like a harp for Moab. Again, Isaiah moved for, for the trouble of Moab and they're not even Israel. But he's again a man with a heart from, from, you know, for God as a prophet and here he is just devastated by the things that are coming. Look how he describes it. My inward parts are moved for Kirharesh, troubled. It shall come to pass when it is seen that Moab is weary on the high place, that he shall come to his sanctuary to pray, but he shall not prevail. This is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning Moab since that time. How would you like to deliver that message? You know, we make fun of Jonah, right? Didn't want to go to Nineveh, ran down the Joppa, beautiful seacoast, by the way, on the Mediterranean, hops on a boat, takes off, He's upset when God finally does forgive them as they repent. But think about when he shows up, he's got to go to, you know, to the area of the Ninevites. They were known for their cruelty. And he's going to walk through a single man by himself through a town that took about almost three days. According to historians, a massive city. And the Bible substantiates that idea. It took him several days. And as he's going through town, he's just always saying to him, "Is yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Not a popular message. It's amazing what these guys had to bear for the Lord. It shall come to pass, verse 12, when it is seen in Moab that it's weary in the high place, it shall come to a sanctuary to pray, but he will not prevail. This is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning Moab since that time. But now the Lord hath spoken 
saying within three years, aha. So we learned back in chapter 14, verse 28, the year that King Ahaz died, it's about 715 BC ish. And here we are within three years, bringing us down to just about 711. And by the way, these things were fulfilled. So here we have Isaiah giving a time period that was basically exactly completed. Now within the Lord has spoken within three years as the years of a hireling, the glory of Moab shall be contemned and all that, with all that great multitude and the remnant shall be very small and feeble. So now Isaiah is moved by the Lord to speak against Damascus. Of course, Damascus, the capital city of Syria at the time. And here we go again, reviewing. And Syria, not a uh, Syria, Syria has been working together with which part of Israel? The northern kingdom, Israel versus Judah. So the northern kingdom, Israel, has been harassing the southern kingdom, Judah, and they have been doing it with the people from Syria, if you remember. So the kings in Judah finally said, we need some help. So they reached out to the Assyrians uh, who came down and dealt with the Syrians, and they dealt with the, uh, the Samaritans or the northern Israel tribes. There are 10 tribes. And so 732, the, the Syrians go down, 722, uh, Samaria goes down, and then they come down and surround Jerusalem, and they're about to siege Jerusalem. And that night is Hezekiah's king, again, moving forward, the angel of the Lord will come out and break the back of that army. So once again, putting the players on the board, now the burden of the Lord for Damascus. Now this is where things get interesting. And I'll explain as we go through. The burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is being taken away from being a city and it shall be a ruinous heap. The Greek translation of the Hebrew, when the Jews did that about 300 BC to 200 BC, it's called the Septuagint or the LXX for 70 scholars, at least historians say were involved in it. The Septuagint translators actually have, instead of a ruinous heap, they put, will be abandoned forever. Now, whether or not they're accurate, we'll find out when it's history, but interesting because Damascus, according to a number of sources, and you can check this even on Wikipedia, Damascus is thought to be one of the oldest continually inhabited cities in the world. Damascus is considered to be one of the oldest continually inhabited cities in the world. Yes, it has suffered military defeats. Yes, it has suffered some destruction. But if this is what it's being said in chapter 17, it becomes a ruinous heap. And if the translators are correct, and the idea of it will be abandoned forever is implied, then this is something we have not yet seen fulfilled. Now that gets interesting. Now please understand this. When I say interesting, you're like, well, you sound like a, you know, like a reptile. <laughs> sound like a cold calculating, calculating academic. Well, how interesting. We're about to watch a city be destroyed. As if there's no compassion for the people that are in that city. Please understand, I mean, if this is yet to be fulfilled, and many feel this is yet to be completely fulfilled, and if I had to be, you know, push comes to shove, I would say, you know what, Damascus, one of the oldest continually inhabited cities, has yet to have become a heap of ruins where nobody stays there. Which means this appears to be something yet unfulfilled. Now our news articles. Okay, let me read you what's going on today in the world, or at least from August. August 28th, 2017, from the Jerusalem Post. Israeli official, if Iran expands in Syria, we'll bomb Assad's palace. And what town is that in? Damascus. Let me explain. Back to your Bible map. Here are the key players. Today, if here's your Bible map and here's Israel, so this is Israel for you guys. Here's the Jordan River Valley. Here's the Mediterranean, the blue. Here's the Mediterranean, okay? What you have is you have Egypt down here at my fist, and you have above Egypt and on the far western side, Gaza. How many have heard of Gaza? Former Philistine territory. Gaza was controlled by the Israelis. Ariel Sharon convinced them to turn it over about the same time we got hit with Hurricane Katrina. The, almost the exact same time, within days. They turned over Gaza, gave complete autonomous rule to the Palestinian Authority. You see, because the, the story out there is if you give land to the Palestinians, they'll give you peace. So Ariel Sharon gave them the whole Gaza Strip. And what did they do after that? Well, three years ago, when we were in Israel, they launched 3,000 projectiles out of the Gaza Strip into Israel while we were going through the land. While we were there, some 1,300 of them came in. 
So they gave them the whole territory, and what do they do? They use it to stage terrorist attacks. How many saw in the news this week Israel blew up a tunnel that Hamas had been digging? How many saw that? How many did not? Israel has produced some improved technologies that are helping them find. See, what they do is they tunnel under the wall outside of Gaza into Israel. They pop out of the tunnels in places like kibbutzes and other things, and they strike the people with the terrorist attack. They strike civilians. And so Israel has developed better technology to find these tunnels, so they're blowing them up before these guys can actually get out of them and, and wreak havoc within Israel. And Israel's in trouble for defending their border and keeping these people out through tunnels. That's what's in the news this week. So they gave them the Gaza Strip. When they did that, all it did was give them a better launch pad closer to the border to launch missiles into Israel. So this idea of, well, let's give them parts of the West Bank and all that, you know, well, then we'll have peace. Well, by inspection, what happened with Gaza, they gave them the whole thing, and all they did was use it to get their, their artillery closer to Israeli civilians and to hit them. So just pay attention when you see what's going on out there. So, okay, so here we have in Gaza, Hamas, ha Hamas, okay? Here we have up in Lebanon, on the northern border of Israel, Hezbollah, okay? Nasrallah and others. Hezbollah, by the way, Hamas and the Palestinian Authority kind of work together, but not really. And they're trying to get the Palestinian Authority and Hamas to work together. And there's a whole bunch of talk about maybe they can reconcile and come back together. And uh, I'm not holding my breath, but that's what's going on out there. And that's in the news if you're paying attention. So Mahmoud Abbas of the Palestinian Authority is meeting with the leaders of Hamas and Gaza and trying to work something out. Who knows? But anyway, back to the north. Hezbollah, they're in Lebanon, see? But what they've been doing for the last, oh, five, six years of this war in Syria, seven years, they've been coming over into Syria and fighting with the Syrians against the Syrian rebels and others. And Hezbollah has actually been really refining their skills as soldiers because they've been spending a lot of time sitting inside of Syria, battling back and forth. And so you've got Hezbollah getting stronger, you've got Hamas doing their thing down here, and then you have coming over from the Middle East further, you have Iran. Iran has come into Iraq because they've first started with the southern Iraqi Shiites, because Iranians are generally Shiite. They've combined with them. They've also been working with the Iraqi army, and they've been coming up and fighting against the Syrian rebels and helping to run the show there in the Syrian war. There's a whole lot of players sitting in the Middle East. Now, why am I telling you that? Well, because Iran's presence is getting more and more entrenched on the Syrian border here, on the far edge, far eastern edge of the Golan down through the valley into Syria on their border, and the Iranians are starting to show up more and more and be involved on the border of Israel and Syria and Iran and Hezbollah. These are client states of Iran. Iran uses the Syrians and Hezbollah as proxies to give Israel grief all the time. Okay, so that's what's happening right now in the world, if you're not paying attention. By the way, you'll be seeing more and more news of Israel responding from Gaza to threats inside of Syria, because as these guys are trying to set up camp on the Israeli border, the Israelis are saying, you ought to be kidding me. We're not going to let this happen. By the way, also, they found cells of ISIS on their border, and as they find these things, they deal with them immediately. Why? Because they only get one chance. There's no dress rehearsal, one chance. They get it wrong, everything could change. So they are constantly vigilant. And by the way, almost always, they respond to things that have come at them. Almost always. The only time they make the exception is when they see weapons from Iran flown into Syria, put on the trucks, and begin to be trucked towards Lebanon so Hezbollah can have them. They will then take out those convoys. Well, they don't really take them out, but someone in that region takes out those convoys. Can't imagine who can defeat the Russian radar and get in there and takes them out. That's what's going on constantly right now in the Middle East. How many have followed this at all? Okay, well, let me read you a news article. Now I've given you a background, this will help. Israeli official, if Iran expands in Syria, they are, we'll bomb Assad's palace. What chapter are we in? Isaiah 17. What does it start with? Damascus getting hit. Well, what could possibly provoke a strike against Damascus? Let's read. In Israeli, Israel warned Russia of dire consequences. By the way, Russia, the broker of power behind Iran, Russia, the broker of power behind Syria. They have multiple air bases they have set up in Syria during the Obama administration. The Russians just rolled into Syria, set up air bases, and basically took over command and control of that airspace. Shocking how fast they got in there. Israel warned Russia of dire consequences if Iran is allowed to continue on its current path in Syria. A senior Israeli official warned the Russian government that if Iran continues to extend its reach in Syria, 
Israel will bomb Syrian President Bashar Assad's palace in Damascus, according to reports in Arab media. Israel also, by the way, Jerusalem Post, solid source. Israel also warned that if serious changes do not happen in the region, Israel will make sure that the ceasefire, ceasefire deal reached by the United States and Russia in Astana, Kazakhstan, will be nullified. A senior Israeli source told the Al Jadia newspaper that no understanding was reached between the Israelis and the Russians. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu did, however, make it clear to Putin that its concerns must be met or Israel will be forced to act. Now that was August 28th, 2017. Let me read to you from Debka Weekly it is a subscription service. Probably end of November, you can find this article on the, before the paywall on their site, Debka Weekly, D-E-B-K-A. This is from volume 17, issue 774, released on October 20, 2017. Title, Tehran and Damascus, so here we are just a few months after August. Tehran and Damascus flout Moscow's plans by actions versus Israel and Iraqi Kurds. I remember last week somebody fired a missile on an Israeli plane. How many caught that at all? How many, seriously, how many caught that? Okay, well, here's the background. Debka Weekly, usually a very accurate source. Sometimes information is put in there to mislead, but this is something other news media covered as well, that Israel suffered a weapon fired against one of their planes. Syria's first missile attack on Israeli Air Force reconnaissance flights over Lebanon. Syria's first missile attack on Israeli Air Force reconnaissance flights over Lebanon on October 16th was orchestrated jointly by Damascus and Tehran. That would be the Iranians. Debkinet Weekly's military sources reveal the SA-5 ground-to-air missile battery was given the order to fire even though the Syrian commanders knew ahead of the attack, which missed its target, would not deter Israel from its flights over Lebanon or Syria, even at the risk of a broad military flare-up, hence that August article, along the Syrian, Lebanese, and Israeli borders. The date chosen was with two considerations in mind. One, it was time to coincide with the Iranian-Iraqi military operation for seizing the oil-rich Kirkuk from the Kurds and a demonstration that Tehran and its Revolutionary Guard Corps were capable of operating synchronously in two arenas. Iran was therefore calling the shots in the Middle East and not the United States or Israel. Two. The missile was launched while Russian Defense Minister Sergei Serhogo was on his way to his first visit in Israel. It carried a message to Serhogo and his principal, President Vladimir Putin, that despite massive Russian military assistance to Syria, neither Tehran nor Damascus were totally dependent upon Moscow and would not hesitate to exercise the autonomy or their autonomy of action when they saw fit. So they're going to do what they want on the Israeli border. Uh, the Shogu visit had been long planned, but its occurrence three days after President Donald Trump's major speech unveiling his Iran strategy lent it extra weight, as did the Syrian missile attack. Any missile attack on Israeli planes would ordinarily have been sanctioned by the Russian general in charge of the Russian and Syrian radar systems, which were recently amalgamated by the Himenin Air Base near Latkia. However, our Middle East sources report that the attack was ordered directly by the Syrian general command in Damascus which means they're provoking Israel. If I've lost you, I'm sorry. We'll come back to the text in a minute. We don't mean to be out here in the Middle East on you, but the Russians found out only when it was uh, about, Russians found out about it only when the missile was airborne. The Assad regime had struck a blow for its independence. The choice of that particular SA-5 missile battery was 50 kilometers east of Damascus, underlined that message. So here we have Netanyahu saying if Iran expands in Syria, we'll bomb Assad's palace. And then three months or so later, we have the Syrians with the Iranians taking pot shots at Israeli jets just 50 kilometers outside of Damascus. Does it sound like there's some provocations going on over there in the area of Damascus? Am I the only one catching that? So here's the question. So what could possibly happen that would cause Israel to retaliate against, say, Damascus. We're, not, we're assuming it's Israel that hits Damascus. It might be someone else. But may I explain or suggest to you that right now, in this region around Damascus, you've got the Hezbollah, you've got the Syrian army, you've got the Syrian rebels, you've got pockets of ISIS, you've got the Iranians, and you've got the Americans, and you've got the Tzpeznas from the Russians, their special forces, and you've got the Turks, don't forget them, and you've got the Kurds, and they're all taking shots. That's what's happening now in the Middle East. 
And all someone has to do, by the way, one of the ways you unite the Arab world is you attack Israel. See, you got Shias and Sunnis figuring out who's really in charge until something goes after Israel, and then they all band together, and they have a common enemy. But as long as you keep Israel out of the mix, then they have their issues with each other, see? So if someone's in dire straits, say Bashar Assad, and he looks like he's about finished, and so he decides to go ahead and throw, the, you know, throw a big one towards Israel, suddenly the Arab world rallies around him. It doesn't take much to have this kind of thing suddenly unfold. So back to the previous statements, when people kind of laugh at you like, ah, oh, yes, what's going on with you, you believer and everything else. If suddenly Damascus, sadly, because we're talking about significant loss of life, it's already devastating what's happened to the Syrians and others, the Yazidi and others who have been fleeing for their lives. And some of them we've been able to meet through missions trips to Greece and some are coming through Turkey. And people who never would hear the gospel in their closed countries because of this mess are coming to Christ. So that God's using it anyway. But all it takes is one bad day and suddenly we could see a major military action against Damascus. It's already been threatened by the Israelis to the Russians. You are a generation watching some really amazing things. But sadly, the, pay, the price that's tied to these things. So here's Isaiah seeing something that, yes, Damascus has had military setbacks and defeats before, but we've never seen it become a ruinous heap. And by the way, that with our technology can be done in several sorties. Who knows how long? But most feel this is still unfulfilled, and there are a lot of players in that region that could tip this off. If you're not paying attention to what's going on in the Middle East, I encourage you to start looking for some news sources, Jerusalem Post, others. There's a lot of reporting on this going on around the world if you're looking for it. But if you're not, because you're too busy trying to figure out whether or not the Russians did whatever here in the country with the current administration, then you don't see any of this. <laughs> what, did I say something wrong? <laughs> Everybody watch a shiny object. Watch a shiny object. Okay, quick, move it. Watch a shiny object. It's amazing what's going on in our country. The burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city. It shall be a ruinous heap. The cities of Aroar. Now, by the way, verse seven, chapter 17, verse 1, again, judgment did come against Damascus. The Assyrians uh, did come in and deal with them. But we have not seen most agree this kind of fulfillment yet done through history, which means we believe it is still to come. Now going back to the time period that Isaiah is proclaiming around 711 or so BC and, and that time frame now Isaiah giving these things. The cities of Aroah are forsaken. They shall be for flocks which shall lie down. None shall make them afraid. Again, devastation. The fortress shall also cease from Ephraim, northern kingdom of Israel, who were in cahoots with the Syrians. The kingdom from Damascus, the remnant of Syria, they shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. And in that day it shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin, and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. So the northern kingdom who worked with Syria will also be suffering from the hands of the Assyrians uh, who are going to come in. And it shall be, and by the way, sorry, that's around 732 and 722 BC, these things will be fulfilled. It shall be as when the harvestman gathereth the corn, and reapeth the ears with his arms. In other words, everybody's going to be taken away. It shall be as he that gathereth the ears in the valley of Rephaim. Yet gleaning grapes shall be left, which means even though judgment's coming, some will escape. Gleaning grapes shall be left in it as the shaking of an olive tree, two or three berries on the top of the uttermost bough, four or five in the uttermost fruitful branches thereof, saith the Lord, the God of Israel, or the Lord God of Israel. And that day... Shall a man look to his maker? At that day, shall a man look to his maker? And his eyes shall have respect to the Holy One of Israel. So they'll be again looking for God for his protection instead of their. And, and by the way, when your fortified cities have been blown apart, what refuge do you have now? God alone. Ezekiel 38 39, this invading host coming against Israel where they're overwhelmed. It's almost as though in the last days, God's going to let an attack come against Israel. Their, their technology is quite sophisticated with the Iron Dome and other things, anti-missile defenses. It's almost as though God lets something come that is so overwhelming and he intervenes that it opens up Israel's eyes again. That though you have great technology and you are extremely prepared, all that is in vain unless God helps you. That may well be the message of Ezekiel 38 and 39 that will cause 
revival and the breath of life back in those dried bones. But we'll see when that all comes to pass. In that day, at that day, shall a man, verse 7, look to his maker, his eyes shall have respect unto the Holy One of Israel. He shall not look to the altars, as they did with these false gods, to the work of his hands, the idols they made. Neither shall respect, or neither shall respect that which his fingers have made, again, idols, either the groves where they did their worship or the images. And in that day shall his strong cities be as a forsaken bough and an uppermost branch, which they have left because the children of Israel, and there shall be desolation. Why? Verse 10. Because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation. Thou hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength. Therefore shalt thou plant pleasant plants, and thou shalt set it with strange slips. So the idea, again, even though you're, you're setting gardens and other things, destruction is going to come. Even though you've set up these idols and other things you've trusted in, destruction is going to come. You've set up your system, but it has all been worthless. In the day shalt thou make thy plant to grow, and in the morning shalt thou make thy seed to flourish, but the harvest shall be a heap in the day of grief, and of desperate sorrow. So once again, what you planned isn't going to work. Verse 12, woe, that's oi, woe to the multitude of many people which make a noise. Most feel this is referring to the Assyrians coming against them. Like the noise of the seas, like the rushing of nations. They make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. The nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters, but God shall rebuke them, and that will happen around Jerusalem. And they shall flee afar off, and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind. Interesting play here. When David numbered the people, and he decided three days of judgment from the Lord, or plague from the Lord, and that angel had the, the angel of the Lord had the sword stretched over Jerusalem, David, seeing this, came to the threshing floor of Ornan, bought the threshing floor as well as the oxen, the implements of threshing, took the wood, set up a sacrifice, and offered a sacrifice in the hand of the judgment of God was stayed. Remember that? First Samuel, Second Samuel, okay, the plague of the numbering of the census. And so it was there on that threshing floor, which is on Mount Moriah, where Abraham offered Isaac, where Jesus died between two thieves, where today is the Temple Mount and the Garden Tomb and Golgotha. That Mount Moriah... When Ornan had it, it was a threshing floor. So Ornan was out there in the later part of the day with the oxen dragging the sled around and then taking the fork and winnowing up the, the wheat and the chaff. And there's a gentle breeze that comes over Israel. And again, because of the Dead Sea Valley and the 3,000 feet up to the top to Israel, to Jerusalem, you have this breeze at the night that comes in. And so when you thresh in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, there's a breeze that comes and it blows away the chaff. That's a topographical fact of the location. The Assyrians are surrounding Jerusalem when God threshes them and deals with them like chaff in the very place where Ornan or that region had his threshing floor. And even today at the nighttime, you will feel the breeze. So when you understand the city, the topography, and the, and the behavior, the patterns of the wind and all that, this is not only a judgment, but is a very clear wordplay for Mount Moriah and the city of David and the area they surrounded. Just pointing it out. So interesting what Isaiah puts here. So if you know the topography, you know the town, you have a very clear visual. The nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters. God shall rebuke them. They shall flee afar off. They shall be chased as chaff of the mountains before the wind and like a roaring thing or a whirling dust before the whirlwind. So interesting, in Jerusalem, they will be blown off like chaff. And behold, at evening tide trouble. Yes, the soldiers never woke up again. And before the morning, he is not. 180,000 gone. This is the portion of them that spoil us. So, okay, they're going to come. They're going to judge. They're going to spoil parts of Judah. They're going to wipe out the northern kingdom of Israel. They're going to deal with these Syrians. But when they get to Jerusalem, one night, wiped out. This also will be fulfilled. Exactly. This is the portion of them that spoil us and the lot of them that rob us. What a job this guy had. You're thinking, oh, Oh, man, I don't know if I'd want this job. Well, let's review some of his other messages. Behold, a virgin shall be with child. We will call his name Emmanuel. Your God will come with a recompense. Your God will come with a vengeance. Your God will come and save you. When your God comes and saves you, he will open the eyes of the blind. 
the ears of the deaf. The lame will walk. Here's another one he had. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim that acceptable year of the Lord. Another one, behold my suffering servant. The Lord will lay upon him the iniquity of us all. By his stripes we are healed. He will die with the wicked, yet be buried with the rich. Yet he will see his followers. He will prolong his days. Things will prosper in his hands. So it's not all bad for Isaiah. We're just in a tough section, but we'll move on next time. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. And with so many things that Isaiah predicted, and they are spot on. No wonder they've tried so many times to destroy the credibility of the book of Isaiah. Thank you, Lord, for that gift in 1947 when they found those Dead Sea Scrolls. And thank you for that gift, Lord, that one of the most complete scrolls they found is the book of Isaiah, which they've tried to attack incessantly as being inaccurate, only to find you preserved it perfectly. So, Lord, thank you that you do indeed always get the last laugh as the heathens rage and imagine vain things. Thank you, Lord, that you love us this evening, and we do pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Lord, we are troubled by wars and rumors of wars, so increase our faith to let our hearts not be troubled, Lord, that you know these things. You haven't caused them, but you will use them, that the world may know that you are God and there is no other. You know the end from the beginning. Please go with us this week, Lord, we ask, and thank you for time and your word this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.